hi there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. Kind of? And I'm your host, Liv. Again, kind of. Today I am here with a very special episode. Like you heard with yesterday's early conversation with Jeremy Swist, we are bringing you a dramatic reading of the Emperor Julian's work, what Jeremy's called the Symposium of the Caesars for his new translation. Like we mentioned there a year ago, Jeremy raised this idea with me and I was thrilled to be the one to host this incredibly cool project. It is a full cast recording of Julian's work. Um, This mythological conversation of gods, Roman emperors, a Greek leader, and others. (laughs) Basically, Julian imagined a time when all the dead rulers of Rome, their first king Romulus and Alexander the Great and handful of others had to fight over who was the best leader as judged by the gods of Olympus. Needless to say, it's fun. You can find more about the production at the link in the episode's description and the full cast list is there too. The setting is the Imperial Palace of Antioch on a mid-December evening in the year 362 of the Common Era the 1,000th, 115th year from the founding of Rome. This is a full cast reading of Emperor Julian's Symposium of the Caesars, presented by Let's Talk About Myths, Baby. My dearest friend, the Saturnalia is upon us. It is the season when the god Cronus has us all let loose and kid around. But I'm no good at that. You know, making people laugh or smile? I'm worried I'll just end up making a fool of myself. Oh, Caesar, is there anyone out there so boring and stuck up that they worry over how to kid around? In my opinion, kidding around should relax your mind and save you from having to worry about anything. Yeah, you're right to assume that. But I've, I've got a different take on the matter. I mean, cracking jokes? Making fun of people? I'm, I'm just not born to do satire. But for Cronus' sake, we still have a tradition to follow. So, in the spirit of kidding around, how about this? I'll tell you a myth. One that might have plenty worth hearing. Oh, that would be so delightful. You know me, I'm a fan of any myth, but especially the ones that really get it right. Because I think about them the same way you and our mutual friend Plato do. Plato's myths have much to take seriously. Zeus, yes. Ain't that the truth? So what kind of myth is it? Well, it's not one of Aesop's fables, or any of the sagas sung long ago. No, this is one I learned straight from Hermes himself. Now, whether you'd call it something he completely made up, or literally true, or a mixture of truth and fiction, well, that'll be evident in the telling of it. Well, you sure introduced it like a real storyteller and a fine rhetorician, too. Okay, never mind what genre it is, get on with the story. Lend me your ears, then. It was the Saturnalia, and King Romulus was welcoming all the gods to a sacrificial feast. But he also invited the emperors of Rome. There were couches furnished for all the gods, way up in outer space. Or, as Homer puts it, on Olympus, where the gods have their unshakable abode for all time. Now, legend has it that Quirinus arrived there sometime after Heracles did. And by Quirinus, I mean the name we should all call Romulus by, if we believe what he told us after becoming a god. Anyway, that's where the party was arranged for the gods. The emperors, meanwhile, had to dine in the lower atmosphere, just within the orbit of the moon. They were kept in orbit by the lightness of the bodies they wore as clothes, but also by the moon's gravity. Now the supreme gods had the four most exquisite couches, Cronus's couch was made of ebony that dazzled with so much divine radiance within its blackness that no one could look directly at it. 
It contained such an abundance of light that it would have the same effect on your eyes as I imagine it would if you stared directly into the disk of the sun. As for Zeus's couch, it sparkled more than silver and shone brighter than gold. Not even Hermes really knew what to compare it to. Electrum, perhaps, or some other metal. Next to these gods sat mother and daughter goddesses on golden thrones, Hera next to Zeus, Rhea next to Cronus. Even Hermes himself couldn't describe their beauty. It was beyond words, he claimed, visible only to the mind, and no easy task for speech to say or ears to hear. There will never be so talented an orator who could compass the magnitude of beauty appropriate to a vision of the gods. Now, the other gods had special furniture as well, either a throne or a couch, depending on their rank, and they never fought over them. Instead, I think Homer got it exactly right and heard it straight from the muses themselves when he said that each and every god sits steadfast and secure on the throne they're decreed to sit upon. And even when they stand up at their father Zeus's arrival, they neither disrupt and alter their assigned seats nor steal them from one another. No, each god knows their proper place in the circle of heavenly thrones. Among these gods sat the satyr Silenus. By the looks of him, he was quite enamored of the pretty young god seated beside him, Dionysus, who was the spitting image of their father Zeus. Silenus sat there in the guise of a foster father and mentor, and gratified this gracious god's fondness for laughter and kidding around by constantly cracking jokes and trying to be funny. As soon as the party was ready for the Caesars as well, the first Caesar entered, Julius Caesar, a man driven by ambition to vie with Zeus himself for absolute power. Silenus took one look at him and said, Look out, Zeus! This fellow here is lusting for power and plotting to usurp even your throne. See how mighty and good-looking he is? Though I must admit, he resembles me with that bald head of his. Though the gods were more or less ignoring him, Silenus kept this kind of humor going when Octavian Augustus entered next. Octavian resembled a chameleon, changing into all sorts of colors. Now the palest white, now red, now a smoky, cloudy shade of black. At first, he surrendered himself to Aphrodite and the Graces, and pretended that his eyes shot rays of light like those of mighty Helios the sun god. So disdainful was he of anyone meeting his gaze. Silenus, however, gazed at him. Wow, what kind of motley monstrosity is this? I wonder what sort of mischief he has in store for us. This was Silenus's reaction. But then Apollo intervened. Cut the crap, Silenus. All I need to do is hand him over to Zeno of Kidium here, and before you know it, I'll have him turned into pure gold. Hey, Zeno, come over here and give my foster child some TLC. The philosopher did as he was told, and just like Zamolxis began mumbling magic spells over him, all it took was a few stoic maxims, and Octavian was transformed into a man of sound judgment and self-discipline. Then Tiberius rushed in, third in order. He wore a fierce and dignified expression, and looked at once like a man of both modesty and soldierly dignity. But when he turned around to assume his throne, you could see all manner of bodily mutilation. Burns, bruises, blisters, scabs, scars, and sores, all of it grilled onto his backside by his licentious and sadistic behavior. Silenus couldn't help but notice. Dear stranger, you sure look stranger than before. But Silenus seemed to be taking things more seriously than before, and Dionysus caught on to this. What's the matter, Daddy? Why so serious? This old geezer here gave me quite a shock, so much that I've lost control of myself and become possessed by Homer's muse. Are you afraid Tiberius here will drag you along the ground by the ears? I hear he did that to one of his school teachers once. Oh, let him go cry his way home to that little island of his then, and torture that poor fisherman instead. Silenus and Dionysus kept on trading allusions to Tiberius's time on Capri, until a malignant monster came onto the scene. Gaius Caligula. 
None of the gods could bear to look at him. Not before Lady Justice herself handed him over to the Furies, who launched him straight into the pit of Tartarus. Silenus had nothing to say about him. But when Claudius showed up, then Silenus began reciting some lines from Aristophanes' Knights, fawning on Claudius instead of the original character, Deimos. Then he looked back at Quirinus. That was a real faux pas on your part, Quirinus, inviting Claudius to the party without his freedmen, Narcissus, and Pallas. But still, send them an invitation. And if you like, send one to his wife, Messalina, as well. Without them, Claudius is just a lackey in this drama, a virtual stage prop. While Silenus kept talking, Nero made his entrance, decked in laurel and strumming a guitar. Silenus gave Apollo a knowing look. <laughs> I see you have a challenger in our midst. King Apollo faced his challenger. I will rip that laurel crown right off his head. He models himself on me, but not completely, and is a cheap imitation at that. And just like that, Nero was stripped of his crown, and before he knew it was swallowed by the Cossetus River. Following this, a motley crew came crashing in the likes of Vindex, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius. Silenus had a severe reaction. <coughs> oh, oh, where in the world did you gods find this swarm of monarchs? <coughs> uh, these monsters don't even spare your temples from going up in smoke. <coughs> don't you see I'm choking to death? <coughs> Zeus looked over at his brother Serapis, pointed out Vespasian, and uttered the following commands. Serapis, quick, send forth that Zmikrinis from Egyptus and put that fire out. Then give these orders to his sons, Titos and Domitianos. Let the older one frolic with Aphrodite Pandimos, and the younger be imprisoned like those in the brazen bull of Sicilia. Nerva arrived next, a man who, despite his years, maintained his good looks, since even old age can radiate with its own beauty. He was the nicest guy you'd ever meet, and a most honest businessman. Even Silenus showed him respect and kept quiet. Hermes asked him why. You really have nothing to say about Nerva? I do have this to say, but it's an accusation against you gods. You let that bloodthirsty monster Domitian reign 15 years, but Nerva barely won. It's out of proportion, I tell you. Zeus refuted these charges. <laughs> Silly nose, you will drop that accusation when you see all the good emperors I will bring in after him. Right on cue, in marched Trajan, shouldering the spoils of the Dacians and Parthians. When Silenus beheld this sight, he wished to be heard, but not seen. Keep your guard up, Lord Zeus. Don't let your precious Ganymede leave your sight. Next after Trajan came Hadrian an austere-looking fellow with a long beard. He was a jack of all trades, especially the fine arts. As he strolled in, he kept gazing at the heavens and prying into their secrets. Silenus, meanwhile, kept gazing at Hadrian. What's this sophist up to? You think he's up here looking for Antinous? Someone go tell him his little boy toy is not here and put an end to his bullshitting. Antoninus Pius entered next a man more moderate in his politics than in his sex life. He, too, caught Silenus' eye. The stinginess of this guy. He looks like the type of geezer who'd save on cumin seeds by cutting them in half. After Antoninus, a tag team of brothers came trotting in, Marcus Aurelius and Lucius Verus. This put Silenus in a terrible bind, because he just didn't have it in him to make any jokes at their expense. Especially Marcus, although he could have made a big deal of how he screwed up when it came to his son Commodus and his wife Faustina. You see, Marcus took Faustina's death way harder than he should have, especially since Faustina was hardly a decent woman. Likewise, Marcus failed to foresee how Commodus would drag the empire down with him. This was despite the fact that Marcus's distinguished son-in-law Pompeianus would have done a much better job being in charge of the empire an even better job than Marcus in looking after Commodus. Silenus could have given Marcus quite a hard time about all of this, but the emperor's personal qualities were so impressive that he was too ashamed to do so. As for Commodus himself, 
Silenus thought him so worthless that even ridicule would be a waste. Besides, Commodus was already spiraling down to earth. Try as he might to keep up with the heroic souls, he was a terrible flyer. Next came Pertinax. He had barely joined the party and was already complaining about his assassination. Lady Justice felt bad for him. Don't you worry, Pertinax. I'll make sure your murderers won't have the last laugh. But you're not so innocent either. If I'm not mistaken, you were in on the conspiracy against Marcus's boy. Next up was Septimius Severus. This iron-fisted gentleman was brimming with all manner of cruelty. Silenus was too frightened to mock him. I'll keep my mouth shut about him. He's not very nice and wouldn't let me get away with it. Severus's two sons, Caracalla and Geta, were about to sneak in after him when King Minos stopped them at the door to check their credentials. He sent Caracalla away to pay for his crimes, but gave Geta a pass. Then he sent Macrinus off to the same place as Caracalla, on the charge of murdering Caracalla. Likewise, that teenager from Amesa, Elagabalus, got a one-way ticket as far away as possible from the god's holy realm. His Syrian cousin, Alexander, on the other hand, sat down in the cheap seats furthest back, upset over his assassination and crying for his royal mother, Julia Mamea. Silenus added insult to injury. What a big, dumb baby you are. You had all the power in the world, and you couldn't control your own family. You turned the imperial treasury into your mommy's private bank account, and not even your best friends could convince you to share any of it. Nope, it just all went into her privy purse. But Lady Justice let the boy Alexander off the hook. Don't you worry, lad. None of those truly responsible for these crimes will avoid what's coming to them on my watch. Then Gallienus came waltzing in after his father Valerian, but in a very different style of dress. Valerian was wearing the chains of his Persian captivity, while Gallienus not only dressed like a woman, but walked like one too. Silenus quoted Euripides' Phoenician women at Valerian. Who's that helmed in the hair of white horses, who leads from the front of his kingdom's forces? Then he quoted the Iliad at Gallienus. Who's all decked out in gold and made up like a girl? Zeus rescinded both their party invitations. Following this duo was a second Claudius, Claudius Gothicus. The gods took one look at him and liked what they saw. So magnanimous was he that the gods unanimously authorized the right to rule for him and his, that is, my, dynasty, and considered it justified that the descendants of a man so devoted to Rome as he should remain in power for many generations. Meanwhile, Aurelian was making a mad dash toward the venue thinking he could outrun those trying to haul him before King Minos. There were a host of murder charges filed against him, and he had poor excuses for avoiding all these indictments. But Helios, the sun god, who's my master as well as his, had bailed Aurelian out on all sorts of occasions before, and even now, in the presence of all the gods, Helios remained his advocate. Aurelian already faced justice. Or have you all forgotten what the Delphic Oracle said on the matter? If they reap what they've sown, then justice is served. Probus came along next. In a reign of not even seven years, this man rebuilt 70 cities and ruled quite even-handedly. But for all this, he suffered at the hands of godless criminals. Still, Probus was duly honored for all his achievements, especially when his assassins were brought to justice. You would think Silenus wouldn't try to make fun of him, but despite many of the gods trying to shut him up, he wouldn't listen. No, we should make an example out of him now so everyone coming in after him can be more sensible. Don't you know, Probus, when doctors prescribe bitter medicine, they tend to sweeten it with something? But you were way too harsh, too rigorous, never cutting anyone some slack. Sure, it wasn't right that you were assassinated, but it wasn't unexpected either. You can't get horses to do what you want unless you indulge them a bit and give them something they like. Same goes for cows and mules. People work that way, too. Again, think like a doctor and their patients. If you can't convince them to undergo minor treatments, 
they surely won't let you do major surgery on them. Dionysus was amazed at this. What's gotten into you, Daddy? You're sounding like a philosopher. Who do you think it was that made you a philosopher, kiddo? Don't you know that Socrates won first prize in philosophy in his own day for being just like me? Or do you think your brother Apollo made the whole thing up about him? Besides, does everything I say have to be funny? I can be serious, too. Their conversation went on like this, when Carus tried crashing the party along with his sons Carinus and Numerian. Lady Justice promptly bounced them from the establishment. Then Diocletian pulled up with his entourage, Maximian, Galerius, and my grandpa, Constantius Chlorus. They entered with arms interlocked and elegantly choreographed, not as equals, but with Diocletian at the center and the rest around him like an armed escort. And whenever one of them got too far ahead of him, he roped them back in, making them stay in their lane. But Diocletian eventually got tired of this, so he took everything off that he was carrying from his shoulders and handed it all over to them, then walked like a free man. The gods were impressed with Diocletian for the harmony he forged between these men, so they gave him a first-class seat far ahead of most of his fellow emperors. But then Maximian started misbehaving, badly, and Silenus, rather than doing him the honor of roasting him, simply denied him admission to the emperor's club. And for good reason. It wasn't just that Maximian was sexually perverted in every way imaginable. It's that he kept meddling in everything and could be trusted by no one. He was the one in the quartet always singing off-key. Lady Justice wasted no time and made him leave the hall. I have no clue where in the world he went after that. I forgot to ask Hermes for those details. Despite this, that fine-tuned quartet started transposing itself into a jarring and disharmonious cacophony. Lady Justice had to break this band up stopping Galerius and Maximin Dia from even laying hands on the doors to this hall of heroes. Licinius somehow made it as far as the coat room before King Minos booted him out for playing so badly out of tune. Of all these, only Constantine managed to find his way inside. He sat quietly for a while, waiting for his sons. Then Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constans all came in and joined him. But it was access denied for Magnentius, his policies were sound only in appearance, but not reality. The gods could see right through him, and knew that nothing he accomplished came from good intentions. So they sent him packing. Now, at long last, the festivities were ready to begin. For their part, the gods were fully satisfied, and there wasn't a thing they lacked. Still, Hermes thought it proper to make this company of heroes below them prove their worth. Zeus had the same idea. Besides, Quirinus had already been begging the gods to let him bring one of them up to sit next to him. But Heracles took issue with this request. I won't stand for this, Quirinus. Tell me, why didn't you invite my dear Alexander to the party? Fine, I'll ask Zeus himself. Zeus, if you're thinking of elevating any of these guys to our level, then get Alexander to show up. If we're putting everyone to the test, then why not let someone better than all of them compete? Zeus agreed. Heracles was right. So Alexander came on in to join the heroic company. However, neither Julius Caesar nor anyone else would give up their seat for him. Alexander did find an empty seat eventually, one conveniently vacated by Caracalla, and sat down. Caracalla had claimed it, but got ejected for murdering his brother Geta. When Silenus saw this, he tried to make Quirinus look foolish. Ah, now, Quirinus, let's see if any of your Romans is a match for this one Greek. Jupiter, be my witness, there's been plenty Romans no worse than him. True, my descendants admired him, so much that he's the only foreign leader they call the Great. 
and they meant it. But just because they call him the Great doesn't necessarily mean that they thought him greater than any Roman leader in their own day. Sure, you could blame that on chauvinism, but it's probably true. However, we'll only know for sure when we've put them all to the test. Quirinus started blushing when he said this. He was clearly nervous at the thought of his posterity only taking second place. At this point, Zeus posed a question to his fellow gods. How shall we proceed? Shall we throw open the competition to everyone, or do we follow the procedure of athletic trials where the athlete who defeats another, even in a single match, is ranked above all the athletes the loser had beaten previously by virtue of being ranked below the present loser and disregarding that these previous losers never competed against the winner? The gods voted unanimously for the second form of procedure, as it made much more sense. So Hermes summoned the three greatest warriors to enter the lists, Julius Caesar, Octavian, and Trajan. There seemed to be no objections to this until King Cronus took a long look at Zeus and exclaimed, This is preposterous. All I can see in this contest are military emperors, but not a single philosopher. I like philosophers no less than soldiers. Let's put Marcus Aurelius in the running. Marcus answered Cronus' summons and showed up bearing the weight of his gravitas. His sunken eyes and furrowed brow showed the signs of overwork. Still, he beamed with indescribable beauty, but not the kind that comes from cosmetics and fussing over one's looks. He let his beard grow super long, and his clothes were plain and modest. Due to his ascetic eating habits, his luminous body was fully transparent. It shone like the most pure and perfect light. Once Marcus made his way into the Holy of Holies, Dionysus had a question for King Cronus and Father Zeus. Hey, Dad. 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 And and you too, Grandpa. Is it ever appropriate that we gods have anything short of total perfection? Zeus and Cronus shook their heads. Well then, let's complete the ensemble by adding a hedonist to the mix. Zeus objected to this proposal. We cannot break our laws by admitting a man who rejects us as his models. So Dionysus offered a compromise. Fine. Then how about the profane contestants stand just outside the sanctuary? If you can make that accommodation, then I propose we call up a man who, while not totally unlike the military emperors competing, is more of a slave to sensual delights. So, come up here as far as the gates, Constantine! The gods agreed to Dionysus' proposal, but the question still remained. What form should the competition take? Hermes suggested the following. I think each contestant should give a speech, one after the other, and offer an account of their career. Then the gods will vote for the winner. Apollo didn't think this was such a good idea. That's not how we gods conduct examinations and make judgments. This should be about what's true, not what's rhetorically persuasive. Zeus, however, found a way to satisfy both his sons, while also keeping the party going into overtime. I see no reason we cannot let them deliver speeches. We will time them with a water clock. Then, after that, we will have a question-and-answer period where we can put their ideas to the test. Dionysus poured a couple cheap shots. Don't use a water clock! Trajan or Alexander might think it's full of nectar and chug it all, and there will be none left for the other contestants. Poseidon called Dionysus out on this. Excuse me, but is not my water, but your beverage that those two are fond of, Dionysus. You should be more worried about your vineyards than my springs. This knocked some sense into Dionysus, so they shut up and turned their attention back to the contestants, since Hermes had begun sounding the keynote. 
Now let the games begin and store the finest prizes. It's time to go all in and not be temporizers. Now heed my proclamation, you kings of yesteryear, who mastered many nations in wars of sharpened spears. Now your sharpened minds are key to victory. Intelligence decides your present rivalry. Great wisdom, some suppose, is best in livelihood. To others harming foes and doing friends much good. Still others' lust for pleasure is earned by their employment. It's food and sex they treasure, which brings their eyes enjoyment. And wearing jeweled rings and clothes so soft and loose, to them are blessed things. But who will win? Ask Zeus. After Hermes delivered this keynote, the contestants drew lots. By some lucky coincidence, Julius Caesar, the man who loved being number one in everything, got to speak first. However, this made him so insufferably arrogant that Alexander nearly boycotted the whole contest. Thankfully, Heracles gave him a pep talk and got him to stick around. In any case, Alexander ended up getting to speak second. But after that, each contestant just happened to draw lots in the chronological order of their respective reigns, Octavian, then Trajan, followed by Marcus, and Constantine last. And so, Julius Caesar led it off. Jove and fellow gods, I was happily born, after a host of great men, in the greatest city on earth, Roma, who reigns over so many more cities than any before her that any other city would rejoice in winning second place. For what other city with a population of only 3,000 at its founding conquered the ends of the earth in under six centuries? What other nations produced so many valiant soldiers and lawgivers? Who honors the gods as we do? And I, born in so great and so marvelous a city, managed to surpass the achievements of not only my contemporaries, but also those of her whole history. And I know it to be a fact that none of my fellow citizens would ever even challenge my claim to first place. But if Alessandro here has the nerve to do so, tell me, which of his achievements could he ever compare to mine? His conquest of Persia, I suppose. Ha! If only he saw how many victories I racked up against Pompeo. How could Alessandro possibly think that Darius was a more formidable general than Pompeo? To which of them did the most valiant army pledge their loyalty? Even the best fighters, formerly under Darius command, the Cari, made up only a tiny fraction of Pompeo's forces. But Pompeo also commanded the men from Europa, who made every Asiatico that brought war to their doorstep turn tail and run. And out of these Europei, he commands the bravest soldiers, I mean the men of Illyria, Gallia and Italia. But speaking of Gallia, shall we compare Alessandro's Balkan campaigns to my wholesale conquest of Gallia? Alessandro crossed the river Danubio once, I bridged the river Reno twice, and then there's my campaigns in Germania. Alessandro never faced any of those nations, but I challenged Ariovisto. Furthermore, I was the first Romano bold enough to sail the outer sea. Now, perhaps this act in itself is no great marvel, but it is the boldness that deserves admiration. And in this I even outdid myself when I was the first to jump down from my ship. I haven't even mentioned the tribes of Helvetia or Spagna or Gallia, where I subjected more than 300 cities and no fewer than 2 million people to the dominion of Roma. And I have yet to tell you the most impressive of my achievements, and those involving the greatest risk, namely that I was forced to overcome in battle my fellow invincible and indomitable citizens of Roma. Or would you prefer to judge us by the number of battles we fought? I fought three times as many battles as those so-called historians of his claim Alessandro fought. Surely they exaggerate. Or how about the number of prisoners taken? I not only subjugated the majority of Asia, but of Europa as well. Alessandro travelled to Egypt to go sightseeing. I mastered the country while I was master of ceremonies. 
Now, would you like to judge how either of us showed mercy to the vanquished? Even my enemies received pardons from me, and Lady Justitia knows how they repaid me for that. With Alessandro, on the other hand, not even his friends were safe from harm, let alone his enemies. What's that, Alessandro? You think you can still claim victory over me? Won't you and all the others simply forfeit the contest right now, or will you force me to describe the cruelty with which you treated the Tebani, in contrast to the clemency with which I treated the Elvezzi? You burned people's cities to the ground. I rebuilt cities burnt down by their own citizens. Was it really so hard for you to control 10,000 Greci when I held my own against 150,000 Galli? I could go on like this and have plenty more to say about myself and Alessandro here, but I was simply too busy to have much practice in oratory. So please forgive me if I say no more. Judge me equally for both what I've said and what I have not said. If you judge me fairly, you will surely grant me first place. Caesar actually wanted to say more, but Alexander, who had barely contained himself so far, now reached the breaking point and launched all his pent-up rage and rivalrous energy into the following speech. Zeus and fellow gods, how long must I keep quiet and put up with this outrageous person? Can't you see there's no end to him praising himself and slandering me? He should have dispensed with doing either of these things, and even though I think they're equally annoying, it was even more unnecessary that he vilify my own achievements, despite the fact that he modelled his whole career upon my own. The nerve of this man, so utterly shameless that he goes around lampooning his own idols. Have you forgotten, Caesar, how you broke down weeping whenever you read a history of my exploits? It was Pompey that inflated your ego. Pompey a man puffed up by his countrymen, but in reality a nobody. He triumphed over Africa, you say? Hardly an accomplishment. Only made famous by the consuls kissing his ass. Then there's the war against Spartacus. That wasn't even fought against real men, just a host of worthless slaves. And besides, it was really Crassus and Gellius who put down that revolt. Pompey simply etched his name on it. And what about Armenia and that whole part of the world? Lucullus earned that victory, but Pompey got the triumph. And so the people of Rome kept on idolising him and gave him the title Pompey the Great, as if he were greater than anyone who came before him. Tell me, what did Pompey ever accomplish that was on par with Marius, the Scipios, or Camillus, who's now sitting beside Corinus over there for resurrecting his city when it had all but fallen? None of those men ever took credit for someone else's achievements. If they did, it would be like if some bloke came along and put a coat of paint on a public monument that was built and funded by other people and then put his name on it. That's exactly what Pompey did, putting his name on other people's achievements, when it's the architects and labourers themselves who deserve the most prestigious titles. So it's hardly surprising you defeated Pompey. He was no lion, but a mangy fox scratching his itches. The only thing he had going for him was Lady Fortune standing beside him for so long. No sooner did she abandon him than he was swiftly defeated. And not only that, you overcame him without an iota of military expertise. That's bloody obvious from the fact that you lost the Battle of Dyrrhachium to him after you ran short of provisions. Don't you know that's the worst miscalculation a general can make? All Pompey had to do after that was fight a war of attrition and avoid pitched battles. But either because he was an incompetent idiot, or because he had no control over the citizens under his command, he failed to press his advantage. In the end, it wasn't your superior strategy that defeated him, but his own strategic errors. The Persian armies that fell to my valour, on the other hand, were all around handsomely provisioned and experienced. But claiming to be the best man and best ruler shouldn't be just about achievements, but about just achievements. In attacking Persia, I was seeking justice on behalf of Greece. And if I waged war against any Greeks, it was not my intention to do them harm, but to stop those Greeks who were preventing me from crossing over to Persia and avenging them. You vanquished Gauls and Germans, you say? That was all a prelude to declaring war on your own country. 
Could there be anything less righteous or more abominable than that? But let's return to the topic of those 10,000 Greeks you call despicable. Have you forgotten that you Romans are descended from Greeks that had colonised most of Italy? I've known this for a fact, but now I'm starting to question it. Now let's talk about your next door neighbours, a little confederation of Greeks called the Aetolian League. You know, the ones you Romans put so much effort into making your friends and allies, when for whatever reason you waged war on them later on. How much blood and treasure did you spend trying to force them into submission? And that was at a time when Greece was already reaching old age, you could say, and against a tiny region that hardly anyone in Greece had heard of during the classical period. But if you barely succeed against the Aetolians, imagine how you fare in battle if Greece was at its peak and united against you. Remember how Pyrrhus of Epirus made you cower in fear when he crossed the Adriatic? Then how dare you try to diminish my wholesale conquest of the Persian Empire when you've spent over 300 years fighting the Parthians, who ruled but a small fraction of Persian territory across the Tigris, and yet you still haven't reduced it to a province? And what's stopping you? I'll tell you what's stopping you. It's those Persian mounted archers. Just ask Mark Antony about them. You know, the one who learns everything about generalship from you? Meanwhile, it took me not even a decade to breeze through those lands and conquer my way to the heart of India. And you think you have the gall to challenge me? I've been marshalling field armies since I was a wee lad, and while the praises of historians will never match the magnitude of my achievements, the memory of them will live on as long as life itself. In that respect, I've matched the labours of the only king I serve, the only model I imitate. I mean the invincible hero Heracles, and only my ancestor Achilles can rival me in that respect, since he emulated Heracles as well, insofar as a mere human can follow in the footsteps of a god. As for the rest of you gods, I think I've told you enough as I ought in defence of myself against Caesar's accusations, though it were better to just ignore him. But if I did commit any act of cruelty, it was entirely against those who deserved it. Most often, these were repeat offenders, but also those who didn't follow protocol. And besides, even when the circumstances demanded it, I still came to regret it later on. We all make mistakes, but it's in the spirit of remorse that saves us by making us all the wiser. But as for those who made it their aim to continually piss me off, I think I had every right to show no mercy. Alexander spoke more like a soldier than Caesar did. But it was time for Poseidon's lackey to pass the water clock on to the next contestant, Octavian. Poseidon, however, allotted Octavian less water than for Caesar and Alexander, who both went over their time limit. But Poseidon was also still mad at Octavian for his hubris, for his claim that he would defeat Sextus Pompey, quote, in spite of Neptune, end quote. Octavian acknowledged this, and in his quick thinking decided to streamline his speech by not talking about other people. Jupiter and fellow gods, I will refrain from getting my hands dirty dragging others' achievements through the mud. I'll focus my speech exclusively on my own. Much like the noble Alexander there, I took charge of the state as a mere teenager, while I'm also a match for my father Caesar here, and that I campaigned successfully in Germania. Likewise, I got pulled into a series of civil wars which I concluded with a victory at sea off Actium. By land, I vanquished Brutus and Cassius at Philippi, while you could call Pompey's son Sextus a mere side quest in my grand strategy. But besides committing to battle, I also committed myself to philosophy, so firmly that I encouraged everyone to speak to me as an equal, especially Athenodorus of Canana. I never resented his honest advice, but welcomed it, as it came from a man I honored like a tutor, a father even. Likewise, I counted Adios of Alexandria a dear friend and constant companion. In sum, I cannot be charged with a single offense against philosophy. As for my participation in the civil wars that so often brought Rome to the brink of ruin, I took it upon myself to manage her affairs in such a way that, by the grace of you gods, she will remain as resilient as forged steel. How did I do it? 
by stoically resisting the desire for unlimited conquest. No, I thought it all through for Rome's sake, that she should only expand to the two boundaries that nature had provided her. The Danube and Euphrates rivers, I mean. Once I had bent the Scythians and Thracians to my will, I acknowledged that you gods extended the length of my reign not so that I could keep on fighting a continuous series of wars. No, I devoted that time of peace to legislation, and to reforming a system that the lust for warfare had broken. I accomplished this, I believe, because I listened to a council of advisors that was on par with the best of any ruler before me. In fact, if you would let me be so bold, I'll say I had the best counselors of anyone who were ever granted such power. And the reason is that some of those rulers let unnecessary warfare be the death of them, prosecuting one campaign after another like they're one of those obnoxious individuals who like to go around suing people. Others perished because they were consumed by luxurious living, some even while in campaign. Even when they triumphed, they cared more for debauchery and indulgence than for anything like honor and glory, or their own self-preservation, it turns out. As for my record in these matters, after a full review of it, I don't think I'll rank low in this contest. But it's really up to you gods, so I'm bound to accept any result. After Octavian, it was Trajan's turn to have the floor. Trajan was no incompetent orator, but he was lazy, and tended to have Lucius Sura write speeches for him. Even now, he avoided giving a formal speech, and instead tried parading before the gods the insignia of his triumphs over Dacia and Parthia, and shouting at them that if it weren't for his old age, he would have finished the job annexing Parthia. Silenus didn't find this excuse acceptable. What a silly man you are! You reigned for what, 20 years? Alexander over here only needed 12. Don't complain that you didn't have enough time when you spent so much of it in sensuous living. This biting comment got Trajan piping mad. And while he was often too drunk to showcase his rhetorical abilities, this time his enophilia didn't hold him back. Joven fellow gods, when I came to power, the empire was weak you could even say it was hypnotized, possessed by the tyranny of Domitiano, who would rather stay put in Roma than punish Dacia for its outrages. But then I came along and became the only emperor determined enough to reduce to a Roman province any territory on the far side of the river Danubio. And to do so required me to vanquish the Dacios, who were the greatest warriors who ever lived. You see, the Dacios aren't just born brave warriors. They also hold in high regard the teachings of Thalmoxis, and so they believe that they never actually die, but transmigrate into other bodies. Therefore, they are more willing to die than others are to go on holiday. Despite this, my conquest of Dacia only took about five years to complete. In the eyes of all my subjects, furthermore, I gained the reputation as the most merciful of any monarch who ever lived. That is a cold, hard fact that no one, not even Julio Caesar here, can deny. I was even reluctant to make war on Partia until the injustices demanded it. And when they did demand it, I took action against them and wasn't held back by the fact that I had reached the age when a soldier may be honorably discharged. Given this record of my achievements, it is only right that you honor me above all the other contestants. More than any of them, I showed mercy to my subjects, terror to my enemies, and reverence for philosophia, who descended from you, gods. That was Trajan's speech. He certainly seemed to have outperformed all the others in regards to clemency, and the gods made it clear that they respond especially well to this quality. As Marcus Aurelius was getting ready to speak next, Silenus was making side chatter with Dionysus. Ooh, here comes that stoic philosopher. 
I wonder what kind of wacky paradoxes and crazy theories he'll throw at us. Marcus kept his eyes fixed on Zeus and the rest of the gods. He refused to give a speech. Zeus and fellow gods, is this contest really necessary? And do I really have to give a speech? You all know everything about me. If you didn't, then it would be appropriate to tell you. There's nothing you don't already know, because nothing can be hidden from you. So judge me as you see fit. This was a surprising development, in which Marcus proved himself exceptional, but especially for wisdom, which I would define, as the saying goes, as knowing exactly when it's best to speak and when to keep your mouth shut. So it was finally Constantine's turn to give a speech. When he had first entered the lists, he was full of confidence. But now, seeing how utterly his own achievements paled in comparison to all the others, really changed his perspective. To his credit, he did overthrow a couple usurpers. But Maxentius was a wimp and hardly soldierly material, while Licinius was an old geezer with chronic bad luck. Both were the scum of the earth and cursed by the gods. Constantine's foreign policy, on the other hand, was a total farce, since all he did was throw money at the problem, buying off any foreign threats. So, rather than worry about this, Constantine now turned his attention to Lady Luxury, who was hanging out by the gates of the moon far away from the gods. Constantine really had the hots for her, and wouldn't stop staring at her. But even though the contest no longer mattered to him, still... He felt that he had to say something for himself. I'm better than the rest of these blokes, and here's why. Alexander only had to face Asiatic barbarians, but I duked it out with Germans, Scythians, and even my fellow Romans. So did Julius, Caesar, and Octavian. Yet when they made war upon their own citizens, it was against men of honour and nobility. I, on the other hand, marched against the vilest and most abominable usurpers. And my act of bravery against usurpers is also why I'm a better choice than Trajan. Sure, he added territory to the empire, but I added back at least as much, and I reckon that regaining lost territory is just as good, if not better than gaining it in the first place. As for Marcus here, well, he disqualified himself by refusing to say anything about himself. At this point, Silenus butted in with a question. But, Constantine, aren't these achievements you're presenting us nothing but Gardens of Adonis? What do you mean, Gardens of Adonis? I don't get the reference. Well, Adonis was Aphrodite's boyfriend, you see. And women would plant flowers in his memory by taking some pot sherds and scraping a little bit of soil into a planter, so that as soon as they bloom, they start withering away. Constantine finally got the joke, and what it said about his whole career. What a shame. There was then a period of silence. The contestants assumed the gods would now vote for the winner, and it was only a matter of time. But that wasn't yet what the gods had in mind, since they still needed the contestants to spell out the motives behind their achievements, rather than judging them based on the achievements themselves. They well knew that Lady Luck had a heavy hand in those achievements, and she herself was there on the sidelines heckling all the contestants. The exception was Octavian, because he always gave her due credit. But the gods didn't make her the referee in this competition. No, they handed that job to Hermes, and it was time for him to begin the question and answer round. He began with Alexander. Alexander, what do you think is best in life? In other words, what goal did you have in mind that led you to do what you did, and for that matter, to have done to you what was done to you? What is best in life? Victory. Victory over everything. And how certain are you that you achieved this? Very certain. Dionysus burst out laughing and let him have it. (laughs) Can you even count how many times my daughters achieved victory over you? By my daughters, Dionysus was alluding to wine grapes. In other words, they were making fun of Alexander's drinking problem. Alexander, however, had plenty of the logical maneuvers he learned from Aristotle up its sleeve. I didn't mean victory over inanimate objects. This contest isn't about that. What I mean is victory over all human beings, and the whole animal kingdom for that matter. Silenus pretended to be impressed. Oh, the dialecticity! 
two can play at that game. Now tell me, what category would you put yourself in? Inanimate objects or animate living things? Oh, shut it. Animate? Sir, I was magnanimous. So much so that I could swear I'd become a god, or was even born one. All the same, Alexander, you were often defeated by yourself, by your emotions, by pain, by any such thing that overcame your wits and damaged your brain. Uh, hold on. First of all, wouldn't you call conquering yourself and being conquered by yourself the same thing? Second, my whole argument is about victory over others, not myself. Oh, you and your logic. How skillfully you call out my bullshit. But anyway, remember that time you were wounded while storming a city in India? You'd have been an inanimate object if Pisestus hadn't been there to drag you to safety. So tell me, were you defeated by the man who wounded you, or did you defeat him? Yes, I defeated him. Him and that whole city after a successful siege. Oh, no, 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 my divine Alexander. You most certainly did not. You were lying in the dust like Hector in the Iliad, pathetic and practically lifeless. No, it was others who fought your battles and won your victories. Yes, but they were under my command. But how could you command any army when you were practically being carried out for a funeral? Here's a snippet of Euripides you must surely know. The Greeks have a custom that should be corrected when enemy spoils by one's troops are erected. Dionysus cut him off. Daddy, time out! If you keep abusing Alexander like this, you might end up like Clytus. Alexander overheard this comment and was stunned into silence. Then he turned deep red and burst into tears. <laughs> this conversation was over. Hermes then turned to Julius Caesar and asked him the same question. Caesar, what was your goal in life? To be numero uno and never to be or even thought to be numero due to anyone in my country. Would you mind clarifying that? Numero uno in what exactly? Wisdom? Eloquence? Generalship? Political power? Ideally, I would have liked to be numero uno in everything, in truth and in reputation. Failing that, I put the greatest effort into being the most powerful citizen of Roma. Silenus took over the discussion. And did you acquire such great power? Yes, absolutely. I practically became lord and master of Roma. So you did acquire such power? Okay. But you were powerless to make your citizens actually love you. It was all an act. You playing the part of a generous benefactor, and all of them shamelessly kissing your ass. You don't think I was beloved by the Popolo Romano when they drove Bruto and Cassio out of the city? <laughs> Not when they assassinated you. What did the Popolo Romano do then? Oh, right. They elected them consuls. No, the people turned on them out of love not for you, but for money. As soon as they heard the contents of your will read out, they realized what a fine reward was offered for taking vengeance on your assassins. This was the final word on Caesar. So now Hermes posed the question to Octavian. Augustus, won't you please tell us what you think is best in life? To be a good ruler. Define good. Even the most malicious rulers claim to be good ones. Take those plague-infested tyrants of Syracuse, for instance, like Dionysius, or even worse, Agathocles. You gods already know what I mean by good. You remember when I prayed to you on behalf of my grandson Gaius as he was heading off to war? That you grant him Caesar's courage, Pompey's cleverness, and my own good fortune. Silenus was at it again. It sure is ironic that this doll manufacturer is listing off all sorts of things that need the help of real gods. Doll manufacturer? That sounds ridiculous. Why are you calling me that? Because, my dear Augustus, they manufacture dolls just like you manufactured gods. Starting with Caesar here, but he was only the first. Octavian showed remorse for this. 
and did not argue against it. Hermes now fixed his sights on Trajan. Trajan, what was your intention in doing the things that you did? I strove to achieve the same goals as Alejandro here, but with more control over myself. Silenus begged to differ. More control? Ha! You were just as self-defeating as Alexander. He mostly lost control of his temper, but you lost control of yourself to something far less noble. I mean the most disgusting and scandalous pleasures. Dionysus had had enough with Silenus. To hell with you, Daddy! You're constantly butting in to make each contestant the butt of your jokes and leaving them without a word in their defense. Now, you better be careful how you handle Marcus here. The other contestants may have left an opening to exploit with your satire, but Marcus strikes me as that proverbial man in Simonides, built with four right angles and zero wrong ones. Hermes turned to face Marcus. What do you think is best in life, Marcus? What's the end to your means? Out of modesty, Marcus was a bit of a low talker. To take the gods as models. At first glance, this seemed not such a bad answer, but even the best so far. In any case, Hermes didn't want to bother scrutinizing it. He knew Marcus would have an equally clever response to any objection, and all the other gods acquiesced in this. All except Silenus. Dionysus, I don't care what you told me. I'm not letting this sophist get off scot-free. Now tell me, Marcus, why did you drink wine instead of nectar and eat bread instead of ambrosia like we gods do? That's not what I meant by taking the gods as models. It had nothing to do with my food and beverage choices. Then again, I did nourish my body out of the belief that your bodies too needed to be nourished by the smoke of sacrifices. But maybe I was wrong in that belief. And I suppose it's not with our bodies, but our minds that we should take the gods as models. This came out of left field and caught Silenus off guard. Okay, maybe your answer isn't totally off the mark. But you still need to explain what you think taking the gods as models consists of. Have as few needs as possible yourself and help other people as many as you can, as much as you can. You mean you were entirely without needs? I wasn't. But I suppose that old body of mine did have a few. All right, you win on that score. Well done, Marcus. But I've got other ammunition in my arsenal. There's still the matter of your son Commodus and your wife Faustina. Having Faustina deified? Highly inappropriate. Letting Commodus inherit the empire? Illogical. But the gods modeled those actions, too. For Faustina's deification, I can appeal to the words of Homer when he said that a good and sensible husband loves and cherishes his wife. As for making Commodus my heir, I can make an excuse out of Zeus. Tell me, what did he say in the Iliad when he was giving Ares a tongue lashing? Oh, I would have blasted you with thunderbolts long ago if I didn't love you as my true-born son. See? And besides, I had no idea Commodus would turn out so rotten. You know how teenagers are with their violent swings between virtue and vice? Had I seen him careening down the path to no good, I wouldn't have put any power in his hands. But as it turned out, that power corrupted him. And again, I was simply imitating Achilles the way I treated Faustina, while Zeus was my model for how I treated Commodus. And besides, I was hardly doing anything unprecedented. It always has been the custom for children to inherit their parents' property. It's what every parent hopes for. And I was hardly the first emperor to deify an empress. Faustina was but one of many others who received such an honor. Maybe whoever established these presidents hadn't really thought it through. But it just seems wrong to exempt my closest family members from a practice that's been around for so long. But the gods would have already known all this even if I didn't just lose control of myself and go off the rails into some lengthy defense speech after all. So please accept this apology, Zeus and fellow gods, instead of that one. 
Marcus finally stopped talking. So Hermes now let Constantine answer the question. What do you think is best in life, Constantine? Maximizing profits. Make as much money as you can and spend it on everything your heart desires. And spoil your friends with it too. Silenus erupted in laughter and came down on him hard. (laughs) Oh man, Constantine, you really let yourself go. You should have gone into the banking business. But with that lifestyle of yours, you're better off opening a candy store or a beauty parlor. Your hairdo and makeup already gave that away. But now it's your very thoughts that find you guilty as charged. There was another period of silence in which the gods all cast their secret ballots. While many votes went to Marcus, Zeus decided to deliberate with his father Cronus in private. When they came out of this conclave, they tasked Hermes with reporting the results. Gentlemen, while it's true that you showed up for competition, we gods follow a different set of rules when it comes to passing judgments. While the victor may celebrate, The vanquished are no worse off. Therefore, we bid every one of you to come up and sit beside the god of your choice and live life like you've lived before under the guidance of a divine patron. Gentlemen, make your selection. As soon as Hermes ended this announcement, Alexander made a beeline straight for Heracles. Then Octavian ran to Apollo, while Marcus went in for a group hug with Zeus and Cronus. But Julius Caesar was quite disoriented and kept wandering in circles, until mighty Aphrodite and Ares had enough of this pitiful sight and called him over. Trajan hustled in the same direction as Alexander and took his seat next to him. Constantine, however, searched in vain for the model of his own lifestyle among the gods. So he turned his attention back to Lady Luxury and ran straight into her tender embrace. She dressed him in a long, flowing coat of many colors and tricked him out with cosmetics. Then she led him away to Lady Indulgence. Jesus was also shacking up with her, and Constantine found him there preaching to the masses. Come to me, all you seducers, all you murderers, all you defilers and perverts. Come to me and be not afraid, for I need only wash you with this here water and I will make you clean. Wallow in sin after sin, and I will make you clean again, so long as you beat your chests and bang your heads. Constantine greeted Jesus with a smile and summoned his children to him. But as soon as Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constans all departed from the Parliament of the Gods, the Furies descended upon them with a vengeance, tormenting father and sons alike, no less for their rejection of the true gods than for spilling the blood of their own family. Zeus, however, granted them a reprieve from their suffering in recognition of their dynastic forebears, Claudius Gothicus and Constantius Chlorus. But Hermes reserved the last word for myself. Julian, I will grant you access to the special knowledge of Father Mithras. Obey his commandments, and so long as you live, You'll be moored in a safe harbor by a line that never frays. And when the time comes for you to set sail into the beyond, your highest hopes will be fulfilled. For this god will stand by your side as a navigator and a friend. Thank you all for listening. This was so much fun to be a part of, even if I judged my own acting skills listening back. That's okay. I'm just thrilled to have had a place for it, for Jeremy to put this piece out into the world. I would love to do more full cast recordings like this, like not that I have the time to coordinate something so epic, which is why it was really exciting that Jeremy wanted to do it all. Uh, But gods, is it fun. So, I mean, who knows? In the meantime, what a perfect one-off this was. Honestly, like, bunch of Roman emperors, but they made it so great all the same. (laughs) Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert, though not in this case. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians, better known as the assistant producer. Laura Smith is the production assistant and audio engineer. This special episode, though, was translated from the ancient Greek and directed by Jeremy Swist, 
It was recorded by Jeremy Swist and fellow cast members. Recordings were engineered by Christopher Swist at Evenfall Studios in Spofford, New Hampshire, US, and produced in loving memory of Lawrence P. Swist. The podcast is part of the iHeart Podcast Network. Listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron where you will get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. I am Liv and I love this shit. 